In 1964, a couple of scientists finally got the chance to experiment with a new piece of equipment. They'd each been drooling over this giant horn antenna at Bell Labs. That may not sound very exciting to you, but it was very exciting to them. This antenna had been built to experiment with sending long-distance radio transmissions. But these two scientists, Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson, theorized that this would also make a fantastic radio telescope, an instrument that could pick up radio signals from space to study stars and planets and other cosmological bodies. However, in order to begin their work, they first had to filter out the noise. Radio waves are pretty abundant down here on Earth, and so they had to correct for all these sources of interference. And this is a tremendously sensitive instrument. The same reason why it's so valuable for the research also made it really hard to use. So they slowly filtered out and corrected for television and radio stations and even the radio emissions from the antenna itself. But some noise persisted. Noise that was much stronger than they anticipated. So they continued trying to fine tune and filter out and look for interference. They swept through everything they could find. Literally, they actually took a broom and evicted the pigeons that had been nesting in the antenna and swept out their droppings. But the noise persisted. No matter where they pointed the, this antenna, at cities, at mountains, straight up in the sky, straight down in the dirt, everywhere the noise was absolutely consistent. They even took readings over time to see if perhaps a nuclear test had left residual radiation they were detecting. But over a year of data points showed the same noise, absolutely regular and predictable throughout. It was at this point that they began to wonder if they'd stumbled upon something larger. That annoying and persistent fuzz in their data sets turned out to be the cosmic background radiation, energy left over from the formation of the universe. Cosmologists had been debating two different theories about the nature of the universe. The static theory proposed that the universe was without beginning or end, that it would remain largely unchanged forever. The alternative dynamic theory suggested that the universe was constantly expanding. And what Penzias and Wilson found, almost by accident, not only testified to the birth of the universe in a so-called Big Bang, but also predicted its death, according to that second theory. Can you imagine something as inane as background noise? The white noise on, that stations, on the stations in between the radio, in between the stations on the radio, Something like that that, com that could completely change how we view the universe. That fuzz told scientists that something about the fundamental nature of reality as we know it. All of a sudden, what had once been thought eternal and unchanging became temporary. Even if it's temporary on a time scale that's unfathomable to the human mind. If even the universe itself has a beginning and an end, what does that say about everything else that exists within it? I think of Penzias and Wilson today while listening to Jesus. Like the two scientists, the crowd today is hearing this persistent message from Jesus, but they can't seem to make any sense of it. We know your parents, they say. What do you mean he came down from heaven? Wait, is he asking us to chew on him, they ask? And yet, for those paying attention, what Jesus is telling them has to do with the fundamental nature of life itself. Humankind has wondered about and explored that nature for far longer than cosmologists have argued over the Big Bang. Every culture that has ever existed has its own stories to make sense of that nature of what life is. Many of those stories involve heroes archetypal characters that embody the ideal of humanity. The Babylonians, for example, told stories about Gilgamesh, the mighty warrior king who sought immortality. The Greeks related the 12 trials of Heracles. And even in recent North American history, people have shared tall tales about Paul Bunyan and Babe the Blue Ox. As I read this story, I find myself thinking about all those other stories. The ones about heroes and monsters and quests. 
And I wonder if all these stories on some level are about what Jesus calls the bread of life. What we need to sustain us, to bring us immortality. In the myths and legends, the heroes, people like Gilgamesh and Heracles and Paul Bunyan, they embody the essence of what it means to live well, to be heroic. These are the heroes that we're taught to emulate. They represent what it means to be human in the best possible way. And yet, by their very nature, they are also so above and beyond what any of us could ever hope to achieve that they are also unattainable. I mean, Paul Bunyan is literally larger than life. Gilgamesh turned down offers of marriage from goddesses. Heracles was immortalized in the stars. But here in this story, we have Jesus. Jesus, as God's son, should represent another unattainable ideal, but instead he comes and he calls himself the son of man, literally the human one. What makes him remarkable is how unremarkable he is. He's a backwater rabbi from a nowhere town in a forgotten corner of a world-spanning empire. And yet this Jesus is the one who comes offering the bread of life freely to everyone, regardless of social class or moral fiber or ability. Instead of some characteristic like courage or strength or wisdom, Jesus says that he himself is the bread of life. And that's where the crowds get stuck. Maybe it's where we get stuck, too. They can't get past the images of bread and immortality. And as captivating as they are, the crowd seems to be unable to follow those images to what Jesus is saying. They can hear the background noise, so to speak, but they're unaware of what it means. So let's try to unpack it a little bit. Let's forget eat my flesh and let's forget eternal life for a moment. You know what happens when you eat a piece of bread, right? It goes into your guts where it is chemically disassembled and what's left over gets discarded. And that energy from the bread gives your body the, Im- the energy you need to continue living. And some of the compounds in that bread are repurposed and used to build and repair your cells. The bread ceases to be bread so that it can become us. It gives itself away for us, in a sense. And that's what we see in Jesus. Unlike Gilgamesh or Heracles, Jesus doesn't triumph by overcoming, by being stronger and by defeating his enemies. He gives himself away. He loses everything. He dies. But more specifically, he dies serving and giving life to the very people who kill him. He dies offering them the bread of life. Like the bread, Jesus is destroyed, and his life, his essence, is given to us. This is anathema to Gilgamesh. When he sought immortality, he wished to preserve his life. He ultimately failed, which may be a commentary on the futility of trying to live forever, at least in that way. Heracles also dies, but he's vindicated by the gods and becomes divine himself, immortalized in the stars. Through his inhuman strength, he achieves what no other human can hope to, can hope to achieve. But Jesus, on the other hand, does what anyone can do. He gives his life in service to others. He loves with his whole self. It is this kind of life, he says, a life that is given away, that is eternal. Other heroes fight and strive to preserve and accumulate life, but Jesus gives his away. And in doing so, he empowers us to do the same. This, he says, is what it means to be immortal, to have eternal life. What Paul sees in Jesus is not just another hero or even an anti-hero, but the very blueprint of the universe. He sees Jesus as the cosmic background radiation, the firstborn of creation, the head, 
in whom the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. He is not just another way of being. He is the barely perceptible but uncannily persistent echo of the wisdom that underlies and orders all of creation. When we look at the world, we observe that power will get us what we want. The heroes of myth and legend teach us to exploit that power, to overcome all that stands against us. But when we look to nature, we see that all power is temporary. What is on top today lies in ruins tomorrow. What is eternal is the give and the take and the sharing that exists between everything, even the very fabric of the universe itself. Just like bread, the universe has a beginning and an end. What was born in heat and energy will die in cold and dark. Our wisdom calls that tragedy, failure, calamity. But the story of Jesus implies that perhaps death is not failure. That maybe there is something that is more eternal to life than simply living forever. This wisdom is born out across the cosmos as stars are born and die and supernovae seed the cosmos with the heavier elements required for complex and diverse existence. This is the wisdom we see in the Christ story as one man dies like a grain of wheat, returning a harvest hundreds fold. What can we learn from the fact that the universe is born to die? What does a crucified rabbi reveal to us about the wisdom of God? What kind of life are we called to lead when our hero is not a man who claws immortality out of the hands of the gods, but instead a God who gives up immortality to be human, to give up everything for the love of those who kill him? Penzias and Wilson listen to the soft, static fuzz of a radio telescope and learned a profound truth about existence. I wonder what we can learn today from the still, small voice of a mortal universe echoing in a man named Jesus.